Welcome to Local Histories of Segregation, hosted by the Othering and Belonging Institute out of UC Berkeley. My name is Sarah Kroll, and I am absolutely honored to be moderating this panel of three brilliant researchers. Susan Eaton from Hartford, Connecticut, Nicole Montojo from San the San Francisco Bay Area, and Rashid El Shabazz from Alameda, California. Many of the most powerful efforts to address and solve racial inequality are local, based on unique community histories, experiences, leadership, and organizing. The incredible authors you're about to meet have helped to create reports on local histories of racial inequality and racial segregation that have become important tools for building awareness of the often overlooked origins of these conditions. Today, they're gonna to share stories about their research and give us a window into their process and methods. All three researchers are passionate about using their reports to both show the deep harm that has been done and to lay a foundation for reparative practices. They're clear that community-based repair requires authentic storytelling from all different areas of society. I know this is going to be an amazingly dynamic session and I'm so looking forward to it. I know you must be too. Now, before I have our presenters introduce themselves, just a bit about me. Again, my name is Sarah Kroll. I use she, her pronouns and I'm currently working with the Othering and Belonging Institute as a consultant. For accessibility purposes, I'm a light-skinned black woman with very short salt and pepper hair, black rimmed glasses and spiral black earrings. Behind me is a portrait of Angela Davis, painted by my amazing mother, and a poster that says, I am a black woman. I also wanna qu quickly share about, um, share that the Othering and Belonging Institute, apropos to the work being shared today, has generated what may be one of the most sophisticated interactive mapping tools for representing race and residential segregation in the United States. It's called Mapping Race in America, and the Institute developed an explainer video of the tool that's being launched simultaneously with this event. You heard it here. We're dropping it into the chat, the link, and we really encourage you to check it out when you have a chance. And now I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge the land where the work of the Othering and Belonging Institute happens. It's on the unceded land of the Ohlone people, both in what is called Oakland and Berkeley, California. If you'd like to name the place you're calling in from into the chat, please do so. It's in the comments section on the right. If you're learning the names of the original people of the land you're on, we've drop, dropped a link in the chat to help you locate that. I engaged in this land acknowledgement, both to acknowledge the land and the people who are its original and current caretakers. The practice of land acknowledgement is a step toward the truth that the land is unseated, meaning it was taken rather than given, and of the grave harms enacted on Native people by means of taking. This is a single step on the journey of repair, not its end. Repair includes self-educating, learning about how you can support work of local Native people and initiatives in your community, and or national campaigns like Land Back by the NDN Collective that teach about rematriation of everything that was taken, including land, 
language, ceremony, food, education, housing, healthcare, governance, medicine, and kinship. We're adding a link to the chat about the NDN Collective so you have inform more information about their important work. I really think it's appropriate to acknowledge the land as we enter into discussion about the history of segregation in different parts of our nation. So that was a mouthful. As we prepare to hear from our brilliant researchers today, I invite you to take the posture of deep listening, comfortable and yet alert. I suggest leaning forward just a little bit or sitting on the edge of your seat, whatever brings you into an engaged receptive space. And I invite you to take a deep breath in and let it out. Let's do that again. Take a breath in and let it out. Wiggle your toes a little bit, wiggle your fingers. That sends the blood back up to your brain, especially if you've been sitting in, in Zoom meetings today. We really want you present for this incredible work. All right, so now that we're present and grounded, panelists, I'm gonna have you introduce yourselves by telling your name, your pronouns, where you're calling from, and a visual description like I did for accessibility purposes. And then please tell us one thing you know for sure and something that surprised you about the research you're about to share. So I'm gonna say those again, it's, it's a long list. I know that you have the agenda, but I wanna make sure you have it. So you're saying your name, your pronouns, where you're calling from, a visual description for accessibility, and then one thing you know for sure and something that surprised you about the research you're about to share. And I'll say one thing I know for sure is that I'm really excited to hear from all three of you. So let's start with Rashid. Peace, my name is Rashid Shabazz and uh, my pronouns bruh and coming from uh, Huchin, uh, Lonely Land, Alameda, California. And visual description, I have a brick background behind me. So uh, what people would call the color orange or I don't know, ember, some of that nature. And uh, I don't know, I have short hair, my waves not really coming back in, mustache, beard, goatee, smile with a gap. And uh, one thing I know for sure is I'm really excited about being on this panel today. And the last one is, um, what's something that surprised you about the re research that you're about to share? Just something quick. Yeah, sure. I think that, so uh, being displaced inspired my, my research and I was surprised that that had been an ongoing theme in the experiences of Black folks in the city of Alameda. Thank you so much, Rashid. Wonderful to have you with us. And Susan, you're up next. Sarah, it's great to be here. Yes, my name is Susan Eaton, and I and my pronouns are the she series. And I'm calling in today from Waltham, Massachusetts, and uh, that's just outside Boston, Massachusetts. And this unceded land, thank you, Sarah, for that sort of important word to put there, was um, once shared among the Massachusetts people. And that includes four contemporary surviving tribes. That's the Mattachesit, the Natick, the Ponkapog, and the Nameskit. Um, my visual description is I'm a white woman with um, rectangular glasses and kind of unruly uh, hair that's a combination of colors. <laughs> uh, and I'm sitting in a room with a uh, green painted walls and a plant right behind me. And I'm wearing a white sweater and a blue and white scarf. Um, so one thing that I know for sure is that um, if I'm feeling sad or anxious, that um, cooking and serving and sharing healthy, delicious food with people that I love will lift those bad feelings and make me feel really grateful to be alive. 
Uh, and one of the things that I was surprised about with this research is I've been doing research like this, not as in depth, but in a lot of places across the country for many years. And one of the things that I'm both surprised and delighted to find every single time is that there were always prophets. I call them my local prophets, mm -hmm. um, some living, some past who said and talked about the harm of segregation way back before it was a uh, subject of a lot of panel discussions um, and who warned about even the seemingly race neutral um, decisions that were getting made were gonna harm black and brown communities. They often weren't listened to, um, but those were the folks and the who I really relied on all the time. Mm, thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. And we're, we're all going to go to the East Coast to have a, a stress related, anti stress related dinner with you. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Nicole, finally. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, uh, my name is Nicole Montojo. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm calling in from Fremont, California, which is unceded Ohlone land. Uh, for a visual description, I am a, an Asian woman with a round face. I've got um, light skin, big glasses. I'm wearing a blue collared shirt and a brown sweater. And I've got a blurred background, but I've got my um, bookshelf in the back. Um, and one thing I know for sure is that I'm so grateful to be able to spend my work days coming up with research questions and collaborating with folks like you all on building knowledge together and doing research. Um, and one thing that surprised me about the research that we're talking about today is um, how far back in history land use policy was used as a racial exclusion tool um, and, and policies specifically that were on paper race neutral go back to the late 1800s in San Francisco. Nicole, thank you so much. Thank you and thank you everyone. Um, before we dive into the research because we have a, a tiny bit more time than we thought, I'm gonna invite you and Rashid, thank you for adding that background. I'm excited to hear you talk about it. Um, I'm just gonna invite folks to take another breath and let it out. And just roll your shoulders a little bit. Roll your shoulders back. It's my firm belief as a person who's a mover, a dancer by trade and a, just a mover by, with everything, roll them forward now is that if we're in our bodies, we receive information in a more powerful way. Just an invitation to roll your neck if you're able. Ooh, and if there's cracks, I'm gonna send you my chiropractic bill and reverse it. <laughs> yes, good, beautiful. And then just stretch your arms out. Really reach them out to the sides and then reach to a diagonal and to another diagonal. And then interlace your fingers and just stretch forward and look down at your belly button away from your screen. And then open your arms and reach up, looking up, looking, reaching, reaching up. And then shake your fingers out, shake your hands up, shake the whole thing up. Thank you, my academic researchers for joining me in that movement thing, yes. Shaking it out, good. I want you to prepare, be prepared. I want you to be light. I want you to, to really be present for, for what you're about to share because it's so important what you're sharing. These are not just academic exercises that you did. These come from deep, passionate places. Um, the work that you're doing is has taken a long time and it's you've built powerful, authentic relationships with the people that you talked with. And I just wanna acknowledge that before we jump in to really hearing about what you've been doing. So right now, each of you will have about 15 minutes and you'll have a few visuals and you're just gonna share details and stories about the research, whatever you wanna share about the research that you've done on local histories of the segregation. And we're gonna start with Nicole. Thank you, Sarah. So just to start um, in our research at the Institute, 
and our work with community partners, we've seen the disparate impacts of the Bay Area's housing affordability crisis. And this includes displacement of BIPOC communities, disproportionate rates of homelessness among black and brown people, and also disparities in access to opportunity and public resources like good schools, neighborhood infrastructure that supports health and well-being. Um, and all of which have cascading effects on all areas of a person's life. So we saw that it was important to look at the current crisis in a historical context, especially as we as a region are asking what we should be doing about this affordability crisis. So we wrote the report that I'll be talking about today called Roots, Race and Place. Um, yep, here's the, the image from the cover of the report and we saw that um, for us, the question of how we get to housing justice has everything to do with history. And part of our work has been to understand the historical drivers of inequality, including the tactics of exclusion and how they were baked into our systems over time and how they continue to show up today. Because to actually achieve equity, justice, and belonging, we have to directly confront and repair these past and ongoing harms by transforming the systems that uphold them and starting with understanding how these systems actually functioned. So we took a historical look at how racism, exclusion, and dispossession got upheld through housing policies and practices. Most often we talk about the federal government's role with redlining, but it was much more than that, especially at the local level. Um, it was, it's critical that we understand the local history of how tactics of exclusion played out on the ground in this region in particular, um, especially looking at the region because the Bay Area's housing crisis is regional in scale. And we know that um, housing exclusion is not solely a function of factors outside of local control. And in practice, um, it was driven by local actors, developers, real estate agents, housing, um, housing, uh, housing owner associations, neighborhood groups, local government institutions, um, all of these different actors collectively shaping local policies and markets. And in fact, what we found was that some of the exclusionary tactics that became common across the country, like exclusive single family zoning actually originated in the Bay Area. And so there's a role for local and regional government institutions in repairing that harm. So we looked at a multitude of tactics in this report, focusing on the period of time before the passage of state and national fair housing laws. We looked at state violence and dispossession extrajudicial violence, exclusionary zoning, racially restrictive covenants and homeowner association bylaws, racialized public housing policies, urban renewal, racial steering and block busting and municipal frag fragmentation and white flight. And we put them all together on a timeline so we could see how they all fit together. And that's what you see on the screen right now. Um, and what we saw when we did this is that all of these different tactics of exclusion overlapped at different points in time and were interwoven with each other. And this entanglement is really what made them effective. And we saw as different tactics came up as time moved on, um, that these tactics are adaptive, that they evolved as court rulings and policies sought to limit discrimination. And while laws have changed and racial justice movements have made progress, we have yet to effectively repair this history as a region and as a nation. So it's important to acknowledge in that in different forms of violence and dispossession, um, these are what undergird the entire constellation of tactics. Um, state violence and also extrajudicial violence that uh, was the starting point of this sort of racial exclusion. And it was persistent throughout history, um, the whole period that we looked at. And the forms of violence have changed over time from colonization and indigenous dispossession, and later um, urban renewal and the taking of land through eminent domain. So I'll talk a little bit about the history that we explored. Um, 
We saw that as the region's population grew and housing development accelerated in the early and mid 1900s, that tactics of exclusion got institutionalized at the local level. Um, and it was around this time that we saw the use of restrictive racial covenants, which are clauses in private contracts and property deeds that forbid the sale and sometimes rental of property to uh, non-white people. And these were most commonly at the time targeted at Asian Americans and African Americans. And so there were very few places um, in the Bay Area where people of color could purchase homes. And then the same sort of logic behind re restrictive covenants um, was embedded in the creation of zoning policies um, or rules about what can be built where, um, except when racial covenants became illegal, zoning was um, able to be used to create exclusion while being colorblind and that on paper, it didn't explicitly name the exclusion of particular races. And at this time, the emphasis um, in the public discourse became on, or the emphasis was on the enhancement of property values. And that became the dominant argument for these sorts of policies. Um, the belief that the presence of people of color and also apartments or multifamily rental housing, which is generally more accessible to people of color than say being able to buy a single family home were detrimental to property values. And so it was then that we saw the conflation of property values with race. And this clearly drove racial exclusion, but um, cities could say that it was justified because the policies don't actually say anything specific about race. And so for most residents, these sorts of social values and expectations weren't necessarily always consciously tied to race in their minds, but they were instrumental in rationalizing practices bent on creating racialized spaces. And at the same time, the intent of these policies, despite them being race neutral, was pretty clear. For example, when Berkeley created its zoning ordinance, which was the first in the country to create an exclusive single family residential zoning designation, it didn't name race, but it was celebrated by California Real Estate Magazine for its quote unquote protection against invasion of Negroes and Asiatics. And so then on top of these public policies and also private actions, we saw exclusionary real estate industry practices as a big part of shaping what our neighborhoods in the Bay Area looked like. Um, and a lot of that was driven by the practices of realtors. And it's important to note that uh, at that point in time, the early 1900s, the National Association of Real Estate Boards included in their code of ethics that a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood, a character or property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality or any individuals whose presence will be clearly detrimental to property values in the neighborhood. And, and so that was considered what was ethical in the practice of um, real estate. And so this showed up in the form of steering, which was a common practice of guiding prospective home buyers toward or away from a certain neighborhood based on their race. So for example, not showing black people homes for sale in a white neighborhood intentionally. Um, and in addition to industry guidelines, there was intimidation of realtors or community members who were willing to do business with people of color and also intimidation um, and threats of violence uh, on prospective residents of color themselves. And I forgot to mention the other slide that um, was up on the screen for a second there. That uh, is, shows a couple of ads for new developments in the Bay Area, one Rock Ridge Park, and then another development in Kensington. And it shows here specifically, it advertises that racial exclusion is part of what these um, developments offer. And it was something that was marketed, marketed as a plus, as, as a feature of what, what these homes um, and neighborhoods are. So you can see in this one from a newspaper, it says, no Negroes, no Chinese, no Japanese can build or lease in Rock Ridge Park. And then the one for Berkeley Park, it says, no flats, stores, or apartments, 
no temporary houses or shacks allowed, no Asiatics or Africans. And so you had these public policies, private sector practices, and individuals that were bought into these systems of exclusion. And these tactics were operating on all these different levels. And through this entanglement, exclusion was advanced and institutionalized via relationships and the influence of capital on public policy. And uh, if you could pull up the slide mark of the two quotes, I think these quotes really sum up what these relationships or how, how these tactics of exclusion work. Um, Kianga Yamada Taylor writes that the problems are not just about the federal government or real estate or banking. It's about the relationship and the ways that private sector influences the direction of public policy. And another scholar, Destin Jenkins says, we might well view residential segregation as the domestic expression of the racial capitalism of the 20th century with government as the vehicle and capitalism in the driver's seat. And so what we saw was that tactics are mutually reinforcing with industry leaders exerting political control over state and local government in order to deliberately advance a policy agenda that protected and served their financial interests. And just to share a story or an example of how this played out um, in Berkeley, the chair of the Berkeley Civic Art Commission, whose name was Duncan McDuffie, and he, he was the person who spearheaded the creation of the city's original zoning ordinance in 1916. Um, this person was also the president of Northern California's largest real estate brokerage and development corporation, which built numerous racially restricted subdivisions in Berkeley and also San Francisco. And so this person was both um, a major player within the real estate industry and held a public position. And he was also an Elmwood resident uh, in Berkeley and he pushed for particular restrictive zoning policies in his own neighborhood. And so when we looked at all this history and, and where it fits in the timeline, we saw that by the time that we got to the civil rights area, era, the legacy of this early history was solidly in place and inequity was built into the physical landscape of the region, which meant that it became incredibly rigid and durable. And because of that, we see traces of this history in the present day. And one example of that is persistent segregation and spatial inequality. And this is something that our colleagues at the Institute have studied, measured, and tracked over time. And they found that the Bay Area is more segregated today than it was even in 1970. And for anyone who wants to do your own research on this and find out about how demographics and segregation patterns in your area have changed, I hope you'll check out the mapping tool that Sarah mentioned earlier. Um, it's a really uh, valuable resource that you can use, and you'll be able to look at anywhere in the Bay Area and zoom in and see racial data at any level of geography um, with uh, how that uh, the racial demographics changed over time from 1980 to 2020. So I will stop there for now. I'll hand it back to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Nicole. Wow. I'm still digesting all of that. Like I can, I feel like my my jaw is starting to clench and my stuff, like like because things are falling into place in a particular way that, and the way you're describing it is really powerful. Thank you, thank you for that. And I know we're going to come to solutions and ways that that your work kind of lead to solutions. But right now, we're just going to all sit with the intensity of the information that we're, we're receiving and how it, how it lands now, how, it, how history has continued to repeat itself. Thank you for the powerful work, Nicole. And now I'll invite Rashid to share. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. And um, thank you for that uh, presentation, uh, Nicole. I appreciate your work. Um, I got the, you know, I got the book in the other room. So uh, my research, focuses on the city of Alameda, California. And the publication I did was almost 10 years ago at this point, Alameda is our home, was my undergraduate thesis. And so I've been uh, in the process on and off of working on revising it um, as a book. 
And um, what I'll just share today are some of the, I think, examples of some of the themes and the practices that Nicole was mentioning um, that, you know, operate both at the regional level, but um, they happen in specific uh, cities. And I think by tracing these things, uh, these, these policies and practices, as well as the resistance uh, to this, or as uh, Susan called them, the, uh, the profits, uh, you know, we can see how people profited off of uh, segregation, but again, how people resisted it and how it persists to this day. And so um, I am just going to give a, a, just a very general overview and a couple of examples of uh, the findings in Alameda. When I started um, doing the work, it was, um, I mean, it's, it's sort of iterative, ongoing process that's led in many different directions. But I really wanted to understand um, my own experience of being displaced. Uh, so in 2004, uh, my family and nearly 400 others, we were all forced out of the BVs, the Buena Vista apartments, uh, then called the, um, the Harbor Island apartments owned by um, slumlords based in Florida, the 15 group. Uh, who have a track record of buying multi-family properties, or they will call them distressed properties in areas that um, are gentrifying and they're able to purchase it and then uh, either jack up the rents, um, redevelop it um, to renovate it and then sell it. And so they've done that in Boyle Heights and a number of other uh, places. And so when we were forced out around that same time, I learned about uh, the previous displacement of uh, primarily Black residents in the estuary projects in the 1960s. And so seeing this recurring theme and the fact that there were some people who lived in estuary or whose family had lived in estuary, and they had uh, experienced what people call serial forced displacement, this repeated process, I was really interested in understanding the origins. And so um, the earliest instance of uh, explicit racial exclusion that I was able to find was in 1910 on the east end of Alameda, a group of white homeowners gathered in the home of a real estate agent because there was a rumor that a real estate um, or actually a real estate, I think, broker because uh, a realtor was going to sell their property to a colored family. And so all of these uh, folks, they gathered together at this house. Um, there's no other records that I've been able to gain access to or know of that um, talks about what happened afterwards. But looking at uh, street directories as well as uh, some of the census records, it doesn't appear that any Black family was able to move uh, into that neighborhood uh, for quite some time. And that's on the east end of Alameda. And What's, uh, what's interesting about that, again, it wasn't um, a policy that was sent down from, you know, federal government. Like, this is something that was from the realtors and the families were all invested in this idea that if this family had moved in, the property values would decrease. It would somehow be a threat um, to their well-being. And so uh, moving forward in time, um, just a few years, uh, the first uh, instance of racial covenants I was able to find also on the East End um, at a property called the Water, um, was it Waterside Terrace? And uh, it's a place where, you know, some judges have lived uh, historically, a number of other prominent old Alameda figures as they uh, have come to call themselves. And so uh, we see an interesting um, coalescing of real estate exclusion and people who have different forms of power. Um, one I will uh, mention with a little more specificity is the um, the fern side. Um, what what I was first uh, to, uh, heard, I, what I first heard was called the fern side pact, uh, and later understanding these are the restrictions that were put in um, by the developer for the homeowners association. So sometimes these restrictive uh, covenants might be put in, or it may be an instance where. Uh, families may come together and come to an agreement to agree not to sell to uh, certain folks. Uh, and in some instances, it would be more uh, through a homeowners association, or it may even be the developer themselves who would put this in prior to selling it. Uh, and so this was an instance where this was um, sort of driven by this developer, Fred T. Woods, who developed a number of different properties in Oakland and a few other places. Uh, and then uh, this was something that was adopted by the homeowners association. So if you were to move here, you become a member of this association and you agree to these uh, these conditions in order to live there. 
And so uh, very similar to uh, some of the ones that, um, that Nicole mentioned, uh, this is what uh, Clause 16 stated. No persons or persons other than of the Caucasian race shall be permitted to occupy said property or any part thereof, or to live upon said property or any part thereof, except in the capacity of domestic servants of the occupant thereof. And so I think what's interesting in this uh, this passage, and it goes on to, to specify African, Japanese, and Chinese, so some of the specific groups that they were targeting, but what's also interesting is that it's not only preventing the sale and occupancy, but it's allowing those folks to be on the property if they are in this domestic um, servitude relationship. And so again, this spatial inequality of excluding people is also a way of uh, reinforcing certain racial hierarchies and uh, forms of uh, subordinate labor. And so uh, that was the Fernside Covenant and there's a few others that I was able to find in other places. Um, one of the things that I think many people will recognize when we talk about racial segregation or re racial segregation is uh, redlining maps. And so these maps that were produced by um, or for the homeowners loan corporation that uh, are understood as being the areas where people could uh, where it would be a good investment, a place to give uh, loans with a uh, lower risk. And so you can see in this map here the area that's uh, Piedmont, it's green. Um, the areas in the hills, um, if you're familiar with the Oakland, um, Berkeley, Alameda, the, this, the East Bay region, this inner core. And so these areas uh, that are green and blue were seen as being good for investment. Uh, the yellow areas were deemed definitely declining. And these are the areas that had racial transitions or they were, um, they were racially mixed. Uh, sometimes the housing stock might be a little older or it may have multifamily. And then these areas that were um, red or rated D were considered hazardous. And so there's very few areas nationwide that had any black people that were not um, rated red. I think it's only one. I'd have to like go back and look at the mapping any uh, mapping inequality website. But you know, if there's black folks there, it's then deemed to be hazardous. Uh, but then it also that also was the case for a number of other racialized. Uh, groups. And so I think what's interesting in this map is, you know, folks from the Bay Area may instantly recognize um, Oakland uh, in this, um, Berkeley, South Berkeley. And then if you look at the bottom, there's this brief disconnection uh, or separation, and that's the island of Alameda. And so the north side of the island of Alameda uh, was the area that was uh, redlined. And so this is an area that uh, about 75% of Alameda's Black population lived in that area. And it was primarily um, um, prior to 1940, it was primarily um, Asian, Chinese, and Japanese, um, African-American, and a number of different uh, European uh, immigrant groups. So, or uh, they would be referred to as these foreign born uh, population. And so again, these uh, racially mixed areas were considered to be hazardous. And so the ideas uh, from you know that early 20th century racial eugenic pseudoscience about racially mixing being something that's hazardous, and so um, just moving uh, forward through through uh, through history, that was prior to World War II. Folks may be familiar that uh, with the history of the Great Migration, and particularly during and after World War II, a massive uh, internal migration within the United States. Um, coming out of the South um, uh, amongst African-Americans, first um, black people in the South leaving rural areas, going into Southern cities, and then many coming West. And so California was one of the areas with some of the greatest uh, population increases, and then particularly amongst African-Americans. And so during World War II in the city, uh, city of Alameda, there were a number of housing, about a dozen housing projects that were constructed, and they were all built primarily on the west end of Alameda and a lot of it on uh, former fill or right this uh, landfill that was created to generate more land. And so what we saw uh, in Alameda was that these projects were uh, racially segregated. And so I have a, a, a second image that um, if you can uh, bring that up, there's a uh, this history of racial segregation in the Alameda projects was contested. And so 
beginning in the uh, the 40s, the wartime groups that were against segregation began to protest this. Um, but, you know, the projects were still segregated. And so over time, what happened in the Alameda projects first, um, it was very there was the intention of tearing down the projects to um, to make profits because this was land that was not being um, taxed or wasn't on a tax roll. Uh, it was seen as something that was burdensome to these cities. And so over time, what ended up happening as the suburbs of the East Bay began to be built out or other areas were built within the city of Alameda, white residents were able to move out of the projects and often into homes or in some instances into uh, these garden style apartment uh, complexes, but black residents couldn't find housing elsewhere in Alameda. So if they left, as was the case in the 50s, when um, a few of the projects uh, were first torn down, they had to move either to Oakland, other cities in the East Bay, or they moved to other projects. And so uh, the project uh, that was called Estuary, Estuary Housing, began to become predominantly black. And so uh, it was it became segregated and there was a segregated school. And so in 1963 uh, or pardon me, 1964, uh, that image is when uh, black residents, they protested at the Alameda Housing Authority. And then they also picketed the local uh, local bank. And I, I think they they targeted two. One was a Wells Fargo, one was the Bank of America. Uh, but they targeted the bank because the chairman of the Alameda Housing Authority was also the branch manager of the local bank. And so there was this connection between, you know, the realtors, the business class who had control of the housing authority, and they were using that power to force people out. And um, yeah, and then it was just ridiculous, I'll say ridiculously racist. Uh, if you read uh, Helen Allen Craig's work about Cordonese's village, uh, which is, was a housing project in uh, the city of either Berkeley or Albany. Uh, she includes an interview with uh, with the um, with the chairman there. And so, just to um, just to go through a little bit more recent history, uh, those folks in Estuary they protested their eviction. Uh, they did this campaign at a park uh, in the Gold Coast, which considered the uh, they called it the white district of Alameda, which is still an area that's predominantly white. And so they were able to get some reprieve, but ultimately they were forced out. Many people moved to Oakland and many others moved to other housing projects like Macasa Strait. And then in the 1980s, Macasa Strait was torn down. And so then they're displaced again. And so um, there's just this ongoing history of folks being um, segregated and expelled um, from different parts of Alameda. Um, I think the last two things I'll just highlight, um, one is related to uh, what would be considered a controversial local policy in Alameda, uh, what people would call the third rail of Alameda politics, and uh, just you know a little bit more context on my displacement, which I mentioned earlier. And so uh, in 1973, Alameda voters adopted um, a, uh, not a referendum, but an initiative, a charter amendment. So many amending the city's charter or its constitution to ban the construction of apartment complexes or multiple dwelling units, anything larger than uh, two units. And so at the time there had been a lot of construction of apartments uh, in the, uh, the late fifties and the 1960s. And the uh, sort of urban legend and the narrative is that there was this widespread uh, destruction of Victorian homes. Um, although I recently found some information that sort of um, quantitatively contradicts that narrative, but you know, I'll get into that once I have all that data compiled. Uh, but this narrative of the, um, the developers is actually true. So at the time there was a, um, in the same way the housing authority was controlled by these local business folks, the city council and some other institutions were um, heavily influenced by folks who had a lot of investments in uh, building apartment, apartment construction, whether being the lawyers for them or some of the brokers, et cetera. And so uh, there's this grassroots initiative to, uh, to ban the construction of apartment uh, complexes. At the time, there was a critique of this as creating an artificial scarcity that would keep people of uh, low and moderate income from being able to um, purchase um, or, or um, be able to rent in Alameda. Uh, nonetheless, the majority of Alameda's then white electorate 
uh, approve this policy. And so it was instantly, it was critiqued at the time by uh, HOPE, Housing Opportunities Provided Equally, who also said that this would uh, prevent there from being these fair housing opportunities. And a number of uh, Black and Japanese leaders uh, who uh, had been involved in some civil rights activities had also critiqued this. Um, over the last 50 years since this has been uh, in place, there's been a number of attempts to uh, challenge it. And so first in 1980, there was a lawsuit uh, that was settled without prejudice um, that, uh, that challenged it, particularly around excluding um, African-Americans and low-income folks. And then later in the 1980s, uh, there was another lawsuit after uh, residents of the Buena Vista apartments were uh, facing a, a, uh, their rent being doubled. And so, uh, and perhaps that's something I can say, maybe in the talk about more in the Q&A, but essentially during this lawsuit, uh, it was found that when the apartments converted from what was formerly subsidized to market rent, there was a de decrease in the number of housing units um, that were affordable because California cities have to adopt within a general plan, something called a housing element. So providing for a certain amount of housing of people with different income, these uh, civil rights activists and these um, uh, public interest attorney, they were able to uh, sue and get a requirement that the city of Alameda provide 325 low income apartments, low and very low income. Uh, that was in 1989 that that settlement happened, and the city of Alameda still has not replaced the 325 low-income units that were lost at that time. And so, uh, again, that was one instance where during that time, Measure A began to get challenged, and that's, that's what this 1973 initiative was. And the city of Alameda decided to settle instead of going to court in order to um, protect that um, to protect that local law. Uh, it was later the subject of a potential lawsuit in uh, 2011 or 2012 over the housing element. And in 2020, Alameda voters actually voted to maintain its exclusionary zoning. And so it's been a long road to attempt to uh, chip away at this, um, this law that is largely um, can largely be cited for uh, limiting the production of affordable housing in the city of Alameda. And just lastly, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, in 2004, our family uh, was forced from the Buena Vista apartments. And fortunately, we were able to find other housing within the city of Alameda. Uh, there was a study that was done by the school district looking at the impacts of the uh, mass relocation, um, or, you know, they call it the mass eviction. And 66% of the children who uh, attended um, local schools actually had to leave the district. And so we can look at um, them having to leave the district, meaning they had to leave Alameda. And so we know that a large number of folks who, you know, from my neighborhood were not able to stay in Alameda. And so at that same time, there were reports around um, housing discrimination against us seeking to find other, other um, places to live. And um, part of that was because we were being defamed in the local uh, newspapers uh, and some of these like Yahoo listservs because we were all allegedly criminals and drug dealers and doing all other sorts of savory, unsavory activities. So uh, just that's an overall <laughs> a portrait of this in the city of Alameda. And again, I just would emphasize that uh, as much as there's been this long standing effort and um, glossing over of exclusion. There has been a long tradition of people resisting and trying to make Alameda a place where, um, as this unofficial motto is, where everyone belongs there. Rashid, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm over here, same clenched jaw going, oh, hell no. Um, especially the, the 2020 election that, that upheld the segregation in, in Alameda, which is really just close to here. Thank you so much for that research. And thank you for sharing it from the point of view of your family being displaced from Alameda. And folks who are, are interested in asking questions, I see people adding stuff to, to the comments chat section. Keep doing that. I'm, I'm collecting those questions and there will be time for you 
um, to give those, or, or I will pass those on to the panelists so that you have some time to be in slight, sort of like a virtual uh, conversation with them. But let's bring Susan Eaton on to talk about your research. Hi everybody, and um, first I just want to I want to thank uh, well Sarah and Nicole and Rashid. Um, you know that it's been really uh, you know both dispiriting and also um, affirming in a way for me to hear all about your research. And Nicole, I had read par parts of your report before, and it was really excellent. And I'm also really glad that we are talking about California and we're talking about Connecticut right? Um, because a lot of times in conversations about racial segregation, I think a lot of people's minds still go to the deep south, right? And so the supposedly liberal areas of the Northeast and the West Coast, um, those stories really get glossed over and um, they shouldn't because they're a really important part of um, our history. And in order to repair, which was the word that I think Sarah and Nicole both used really eloquently, um, we need to understand the we need to understand what happened, <laughs> so that we can we can think about the we can understand really the full extent of the harm done, and the path toward repair. Um, so maybe you can just put up the um, first slide there of the of the report. Um, so. The report that I'm going to be talking about or drawing from today is called The Steady Habit of Segregation that was released in 2021. And um, significantly, there were four organizations that worked together to publish this report. I researched and wrote it, but it was the Poverty and Race Research Action Council in Washington, D.C., the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund um, in New York, and then the Open Communities Alliance, which is a local organization, nonprofit organization in Hartford, Connecticut, which is the topic of this report um, that works to um, change policy and practice around fair housing. And then finally, the institute that I run at Brandeis University, the Silliman Center for the Advancement of Philanthropy. Um, now I should say, so this report came out in 2021, but in in a lot of ways, it was a continuation of research and work that I had done um, for a book that I published in 2007 called The Children in Room E4, which is a chronicle of some civil rights litigation around education. Um, and it was a it was a narrative book. I started my career as a journalist. I still weave my journalism work into my academic work. Um, and uh, a lot of the material that's in this report was stuff that my editor said <laughs> is too much. You can't put all of this in the book. So I finally got my revenge and wrote this long report. But um, I want to start. I mean, you got you, Nicole and Rashid did such a great job of sort of all of the horrible tactics. And I love that word that Nicole used a tactic because it puts it as, you know, purposeful. It's a really strong, good word. Um, so I'm not going to go into great detail because in some ways it's just like, yep, take exactly the kinds of things that both of you just talked about and just go across the country and the, it's, and change the names and just make the communities a little smaller, um, make the food not as good. And that's what, that's what you've got in, in Connecticut. But, um, I want to share just a few stories, right. Of, of people who I met at the very beginning of my research for my book and whose stories stayed in my head and helped me were kind of like my flashlights, right? As I went about and tried to figure out what had happened and what had gone on and how did this region become so segregated and so incredibly unequal. Um, the first is a gentleman by the name of Alan Green, who's recently passed away, sadly. He was, he was a local lawyer at the time I talked to him, very affluent, prominent African-American gentleman, sat on many boards, was a leader in the community. And he kind of waxed nostalgic about living in what is now a 100% um, Black and Puerto Rican neighborhood in the north end of Hartford, grew up there. And he said, I had white friends, I had Asian friends and I had Jewish friends and we ate at each other's houses and our families worked together and we all worked together on civil rights, um, you know, protests and resistance and we were friends and then everything changed over time. 
And so I wanted to understand, okay, so how did Alan's life and his experience, you know, change? And how did that neighborhood change in the way that he described? Another story was I was doing a lot of research on a particular school in the same neighborhood. Um, there were two um, girls, Rashida and Raven, sisters. And I said, hey, do you guys want to go get some ice cream? And they both said, yes, we can, Susan, but you can't not, you can't get ice cream in the city of Hartford. And I said, what? And they said, you can't get an ice cream cone in the city of Hartford. You have to go to like this suburb way over there in what was called West Hartford, which was a separate suburb. There are no ice cream cones in Hartford. And I was like, no, that is can't be possible. Well, of course the girls were correct. And so I wanted to understand, oh my God, like how did that happen? How did this disinvestment, right? How did it come to this? Um, and these girls had this sense that they were crossing this major border to get a freaking ice cream cone, right? Um, and then lastly, a civil rights lawyer by the name of John Britton, who would later bring some landmark litigation, which was the subject of my book, talked about moving to Hartford from Mississippi um, in the 1970s and noticing being shocked and disturbed by the level of racial segregation that he saw when he drove around the region. He would be in a, quote, white suburb and everybody was white. He'd be um, in air, parts of Hartford when school was letting out and all of the kids in 1970 in certain places were black or brown children. He saw crossing the street, getting onto the you know buses, whatever. And he tr couldn't make sense of it and he was disturbed by it. And those were all stories that kind of helped shape the questions that I would ask. Um, and so in the end, this report, like your reports and your um, thesis, which I, I hope is gonna be a book someday, um, it just, it tells a story and its principal characters are like in your stories as well, government actors at the local state and national levels who through deliberate action, through willful neglect or both played integral roles in creating and sustaining racial and ethnic residential and school segregation in the Hartford metropolitan region. So the Hartford metropolitan region is home to about 1.2 million souls. It contains the city of Hartford and many, a couple of other cities and many suburbs that surround it. And the way that it is organized is like many metros in the Northeast, you've got the city of Hartford, which is majority black and brown. And then outside you've got a ring of fairly diverse communities. And then not very far outside, you see very little racial and economic diversity in those outer ring suburbs. And so by all available measures, um, both the state of Connecticut and the metro Hartford area have extremely high levels of racial and ethnic segregation in both housing and their public schools relative to other metros in the United States. Um, specifically Connecticut, um, in Connecticut, about 70% of people of color live in only 15 of the state's 170 cities and towns. So um, like in the, in the places that Nicole and Rashid described in Metro Hartford, um, racial segregation emerged from, and it's also been maintained um, by myriad intertwined forces, right? So, the evidence that I collected in the report really points to, th to three particular powerful drivers. Um, one, again, federal, state, and local government action. So willful inaction. So this includes repeated rejections of regionalism in favor of local discretion. And that sounds really boring and really academic, but it's quite important. Um, and it's because when you've got local communities and they're segregated by race and by class and you're giving the local communities decision making power about how to use their land, where to make investments, what has happened is that the white communities, wealthy communities want to remain exclusive and white and they do that through a variety of means, through zoning, by, by putting on, Rashid, Rashid pointed out, putting on limits on how much multifamily housing can be present. Um, and so this local control extends to, to education, right? So where the boundary lines, so in the Northeast, the boundary lines between schools are coterminous with those little tiny um, school, like uh, municipalities. So you've got school districts, you've got 
170 school districts in this tiny state of Connecticut, right, drawn along these lines that have created housing segregation. Um, so through 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 all of this, so legislators rejected numerous proposals that would have reduced racial and economic segregation in the schools and made made the schools more kind of a regionally based system. And these decisions to reject integration, both at the local and the state levels, came after there was fierce white suburban resistance to any change. Um, and this report also documents that until quite recently, government officials even enforced, it, enforced these school district boundaries through criminal penalties. Like say a mom, there's an example of a mom who um, was homeless and she had lived in the city of Norwalk, but she ended up be being in a shelter in the city of Bridgeport. Well, she wanted her kids to continue going to the Norwalk public schools. And so she lied and said she was still a resident of Norwalk. She was threatened with jail time. Um, and there were several other instances of this. Um, so another, another driver of segregation and inequality is, um, again, as you both pointed out, racially discriminatory action on the part of institutions and industries like banks, like insurance companies, banks that would take, you know, deposits from the city of Hartford and then invest in mortgages in white suburban communities, insurance companies that refuse to give insurance to or gave exorbitantly priced or terrible insurance policies to um, black and brown would-be homeowners in black and brown communities um, made it extremely difficult for them. Um, landlords who, um, again, like you both pointed out, steered people based on race, um, just made people feel totally um, uh, unwelcome in particular communities. Um, and all of these different industries, it's important to remember, at least in the case of Connecticut, that even though they're private industries, and we can say, oh, well, they were just private, you know, people acting on the profit motive. Um, but the government, the state government actually had regulatory authority over these agencies. And over and over again, these problems and these problems of discrimination were um, evidenced by housing testing, by reports, by those prophets that I talked about who did these investigations and who testified at different hearings saying that this was going on and yet no regulatory action was ever um, taken. And then finally, the third driver is more contemporary and continuing government action. And that includes this fidelity to an enforcement of school district borders and really well-documented exclusionary housing-related um, practices. Um, and this has to do with zoning, right? And this also has to do with, um, you know, um, the fact that housing authorities are based on, you know, uh, a local, a local model in which the city of Hartford, which has built, you know, huge amounts of affordable housing and has the most inclusionary zoning. Um, but meanwhile, just next door, you know, the town of Glastonbury has very strict limits on how much affordable, how much multifamily housing can be built and how many acres you need in order to build a home. Um, so the racial segregation that you see now still when you drive through the region was not an accident. It has strong and really enduring roots in racial and ethnic and economic discrimination. And neither is the condition of segregation harmless. It's not a simple matter of people from different racial groups living apart from each other. We know through decades of evidence that segregation confers unequal opportunity. Um, and it both reflects and it also worsens existing inequalities and cleavages in society. And so if you can put up that, I forgot to put up the slide of the, the Hulk map. So that's, again, this is, again, Nicole and Rashid were so eloquent in how they talked about this, but, and this is exactly what Nicole quoted from, that a realtor should, should never be instrumental, et cetera, et cetera. And then you see in Hart, in Hartford, this is the, this is Hartford itself. Um, there are these two neighborhoods later, there would be more um, that were um, considered to be bad investments. That's where I spent most of my time doing my contemporary research. So if you wouldn't mind putting up the next slide, the mystery slide mover. Um, so in 1989, 
If you see on the left, the gentleman on the left is John Britton, who I talked about before. He came to Hartford in the 1970s to work as a law, to be a law professor at the University of Connecticut. And he, along with a group, a very large group of civil rights attorneys in 1989, filed a lawsuit called Chef V. O'Neill. And the plaintiff argument was that um, the racial segregation, the racial and economic segregation in the city of Hartford was denying Hartford students an equal educational opportunity. It took uh, many years, but in 1996, the state's highest court um, ruled in favor of the plaintiffs and the plaintiffs were two named plaintiffs. There were many main plaintiffs, but the lead plaintiffs in the case were in the, or in the other photograph, Elizabeth Sheff and her son Milo. They ruled in favor of the plaintiffs and this has not solved the problem, but it, um, it has led to a root of repair, um, the creation of many magnet schools and programs that um, allow for more racial integration um, in the region. And unlike almost every other metro in the Northeast, the Hartford Public Schools has actually seen a decline, the Hartford region has actually seen a decline, not in housing segregation, but in, um, in school segregation over the last five years. So, um, so that's part of the story, <laughs> but that's where, where I will end. Susan, thank you so much for that. Thank you for all the stories and the images. Thank you all. And before we move on, and I know people are have questions, they're collecting, and I promise you um, we'll have time for them to answer those. But I'm going to just invite folks, if you're able, to just stand, gently stand. Just take a moment. I invite the panelists to do the same. And just ground your feet. And we're gonna make, really make sure that we're present here for the next round of, of conversation that they're gonna have. So we're, what we're gonna do is you're gonna shake one hand eight times, then the other hand eight times, then the leg eight, then the leg eight. Then we're gonna do four, 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 two, 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 and then one, one, one. You just follow me, ready? Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, leg, one, two. Four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. Now two. One, two. One, two. One, two. One. Now one. 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 Now shake everything out. That's everybody, not just not just the people on screen. And gently come back to your screen. Now I know I know I warned the panelists today that I was going to get them up and moving. Everybody was willing, so I just give you major respect for doing this. I respect researchers who are also willing to get up and move. Um, my father was a a researcher, a professor of religious studies, and he always was like, "Well, movement is great on stage, Sarah, but not so much in in academic settings." And so my my vision, my passion, is to make sure that that academics continue to move because we have to move in movements for social justice. So I always say. Anyway, let's have everybody, Mark, if you could put everybody up equally on the screen. Um, the next thing we're gonna have folks talk about, and we'll do a round robin, but I, I encourage you also to ask each other questions. Imagine that we're sitting at a table together, maybe eating some of Susan's delicious food that she cooked because she was stressed out about something, um, even though the food is better on this coast, so you say. Um, so I want you to talk about, um, give, like, and give us some insight into how you put your reports together. What were the message, methods that you used and how you combined stories, experiences with data and secondary research? And there was actually one question um, when Rashid, you were talking, um, I don't know who asked it, but it was, how did you find the racial covenants? So that was one of the questions that was asked, but um, loosely, Rashid, Susan, and then Nicole will share, but please make it like you're sitting at a table speaking to each other. Talk about your methods. Talk about how you combine stories and data. And Rashid, you can jump in. Sure, thanks. Uh, so I think I started off reading a lot of local histories and seeing how Th what kind of sources they used. And so I would read something and they 
reference a document and I say, oh, where can I find that at? Oh, I got to go to D.C.? Okay. <laughs> so I was able to do that, but I'll come back uh, maybe to that. Um, a lot of um, like the early period, I, I was able to use uh, census records to identify uh, where Black folks lived in the 1800s, early 1900s. And so I was able to access that through Ancestry.com. So you're able to go by, you know, decade. And except for 1890, apparently there's some fire in the 20s and you know, I couldn't get some of that, but I would, um, you know, go in Alameda, Alameda, California, and I'd put Negro or colored or black, all the different designations we've had over time. And I'd use that to, um, or mulatto, and I'd use all of that to try to find black folks. I'd write down the addresses. And then um, sometimes I'd go then to the local library and they have these city directories. And so I'd look in the directories and I'd use the last name and then I'd see, you know, and, and though I'd see if they're, the people are still there. Um, whereas the census um, is every 10 years, these directories were often every year. And so I can then try to track the movement of people. So that's some of the stuff I did during that early time period. Um, and then in some other instances, there were other uh, archives I was able to access and look at uh, information and, um, you know, I think the best archive, which I did not use enough, uh, is the um, our people. <laughs> so interviewing, um, I only interviewed about five people when I uh, did the initial report. I've done a number since then. But, um, you know, those um, I, I wanted to do interviews because I knew that the records I was interested in finding in uh, finding that would have helped me tell the story. Um, I either couldn't have access to it. Um, so at that time, like when I started my research, I went to the Alameda Museum. I asked them, hey, I'm looking for information about, you know, black people in Alameda. And I was directed to the library. And so uh, that's a problem. Uh, but the library was very useful and I could, you know, find old newspaper articles and I could, you know, use quotes if people were quoted and incorporate that into the narrative. But there's a lot of stories like people who weren't talked to, people who had experiences that, um, just weren't documented in those same ways or because we've been displaced so many times things that people may have kept records that maybe they ended up in storage or maybe they ended out on the street in a trash can because people have been forced out so many times um and then just lastly as far as the restrictive covenants um i was um through connections with uh, different people i was able to identify those first uh covenants um, through uh just connections so there's uh people i've met that live in the fern side and they knew of clause 16 because that was still on their uh, their documents. And so even though, you know, in 19, I think it was 69, it was um, the, the Homeowners Association uh, voted to remove it uh, because it's this legal document, it still uh, exists. And so, you know, having some information from them, I was then able to go to the county, uh, the county clerks or the recorder, and then, you know, do this reverse search, go back to 1925, find Fred T. Wood, and then be able to find the Fernside documents. And so a combination of a number of different methods and writing it, you know, I think as Susan said, it's like that narrative is really, I think it's important. It enriches the story. So it's one thing to just tell y'all that, you know, 400 people or nearly 400 families were forced out of the Harbor Island apartments in 2004. And it's another thing to say, I was forced out of the apartments. Uh, my friend's grandma died hella kids couldn't go to school in Alameda anymore. And, um, you know, it upended people's lives. Yes. Thank you, Rashid. Susan. Yeah, so um, that, so Rashid, that was your, seat, that was like an undergrad thesis? Yes. That's impressive. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's impressive. Um, so do you want me to talk about, you want to talk about my methods? Yeah. That's right. The right. Methods and sort I of just have to ask that because it, that's like amazing that you did that as an undergrad. But anyway, um, so I'm not sure I would recommend necessarily the methods that I used to write the original book, which then led to the, um, you know, years later ended up being repurposed in part for this report, but um, 
my first method or my first instinct was to just talk to as many people as I possibly could. And I had the luxury of having a grant um, to be in a contract with a publisher to be able to do that. And um, that really got me lost in a, in a way, but it was good. It was good to get lost in the community and to kind of get a sense. And I was really interested. I, I spent a lot of time just getting people's stories and experiences and their life experiences and their life stories. And over time, like a pattern and the same themes just kept emerging, right? Like people would say the same things over and over again, or like, I remember when that neighborhood was really prosperous. And I remember before that highway was built, how we used to live and the place, the stores we used to go to, and that it was, you know, a Jewish, you know, deli and a and an African American family had a bakery and, you know, and and these sudden kind of visuals that people created. And then they'd show me photographs. And then that it wasn't in until I kind of had that kind of in my head and I had a map of that. And then I went to the library, you know, to the state library and I wanted to try and understand things. But I was really lucky because of that legal case that I was originally writing about. The lawyers had actually kept files of all these, you know, um, human rights commissions reports and um committee on civil rights reports and u.s commission on civil rights and housing testing reports and all of these you know different types of lawsuits that were filed that were never adjudicated um so i sort of took all of that and then went to the library as well and with the stories was able to create a kind of timeline um for this particular report, the goal was really to kind of bring everything together into one place um, so that people could use it. Um, so I don't know if that's really counts as a as a method. <laughs> but um, but I love doing, you know, both types of research, like when Rashid, when you were just you were just talking about, oh, then I went to the census and then I went here and I was like, oh, my, man, like that. That just, I love that and that combination of people. And when you start to read the documents and read the reports, you're like, okay, that's why this happened to Alan. That's why, that's why there's no ice cream in Hartford. Like, okay, I get it now. Um, so it's kind of non-standard, I think, but <laughs> it's how I did it. I love that, Susan. Thank you for sharing your scrappy, like in this grassroots methodology. I mean, that's that's part of what this is, right? Um, Nicole, you want to jump in? Sure. Thank you. Um, I see a lot of parallels between Rashid and Susan, what you did, and sort of our approach to this report. And I should have mentioned at the very beginning that I am just one of three authors of this report, which was written by Eli Moore, Nicole of Maori, and myself. And, and so we started with the, the recognition that a lot has been documented locally already, but hasn't been necessarily woven together in a way that tells a regional story. And so like Rashid and Susan, we spent a lot of time in the library looking at books and testimonies from civil rights commission hearings and scholarly articles. Um, which uh, have, were amazing sources that just don't get enough attention. And like Rashid said, we looked for documents that all of these sources referenced. Um, and we started with what we know about exclusion and exclusionary tactics that existed more generally at the national level and looked into um, the sources that we identified for specific examples and stories of how they manifested in the Bay Area. And, and so we we're looking for stories of particular people and moments and shifts in law and policy and various campaigns for initiatives um, and, and looked for, um, or looked to try to understand how all of these different things related to each other and what were the power dynamics at play and who held the power to drive these shifts in policy and practice. Um, 
And, and as we did that, we, we tried to trace how all these different tactics evolved and connected to each other uh, to really see this full picture um, along the same lines of what Susan described of all of these different actors sort of in a constellation. And, and really looking at the specific stories made it clear. Um, there's one story that opens up the report uh, about a Chinese American family in um, San Mateo County who tried to move into South San Francisco. And the particular story really illuminated all of these different actors and connections at play because it was um, sort of similar to a story that Rashid shared about um, a town meeting that got called by the city manager and all the residents of this neighborhood showed up and, and protested them moving into the community. And it was decided that they couldn't. And, and a lot of that was driven by the original developer of that neighborhood, um, sending a letter to homeowners that urged them to protect their private property rights and um, make sure that this family didn't move into the community. And, and part of that story was also that the city manager was also a resident of that neighborhood. Um, so just seeing all these different connections when you look at very specific stories makes makes the whole picture um, really clear. And um, so the, we, we looked at those stories and once we documented all of the cases that we found, we also wanted to look to the archives to see what sorts of historical materials beyond the report we could find linked to the stories, um, recognizing that <laughs> if we put something out there, <laughs> it would be better if we could share images and um, archival material beyond just a very long report of text. Um, so we we look to library collections and there, there's really amazing archives out there. Um, one that was particularly helpful for us was the Bancroft Library on, on UC Berkeley's campus. For anyone who's local to the Bay Area, um, you can access it. And, and that's where we, we found the archives. There's an entire folder uh, about the Mason McDuffie Corporation and found like the actual paper racial covenants and documents from their business. And, and then there's also a ton that's available online of archives that have been digitized, like the real estate ads, um, the city of San Francisco's brochure that they put out um, selling land that was taken by eminent domain um, during urban renewal in the Fillmore. Um, and, and it's amazing how much you can find just by searching online. Um, and all of these materials, uh, the political campaigns against fair housing policies, um, like brochures from that, um, really told a very clear story about what the public discourse around housing and property rights was in the Bay Area. And, um, and, and that was the essence of the approach we took, I think, very similar to Susan, I, it might not be what you'd call like a traditional method um, and felt quite scrappy. <laughs> um, and, and also like what Rashid said, I uh, said, I, I wish we did spend more time talking to folks in the community. And that's something that we've continued to try to do um, because there are folks with really important stories to tell about how um, these tactics of exclusion affected them um, and continue to, to, um, to manifest in their communities today. And um, just one to highlight, I recently spoke to folks from Golden Gate Village Residence Council, which is a public housing development in Marin City. Um, and, and they've been organizing for decades to resist displacement um, from this public housing um, community that is the only majority black community in Marin County, which is extremely wealthy, white and exclusionary. And, um, and I recently read today that, um, that the plan that they had been working on uh, putting forward to ensure the preservation of the community and to protect the community from displacement was 
recently cleared by the housing authority, which is a tremendous win for them. Um, and, and I was so appreciative of just hearing um, in detail about how, um, how they fought for, for um, their community over the many years and it speaks a lot to the resistance that we didn't get to cover in our report as much, but um, agree with Rashid that that's such an important story to tell. Thank you so much, Nicole. And I'm going to keep us all all here on the screen together. And because these are incredible researchers who are steeped in the research of, of segregation, racial segregation in neighborhoods and have done like many years and many scrappy hours of, of collecting data and collecting stories, I would love for you all to just ask each other some questions. Like what comes up? And it's specifically around solutions, specifically like because we're talking about tactics of exclusion, um, how does this research catapult us into maybe something that's more about inclusion? What are your dreams? What are your fantasies? You know, the, maybe the first question to start off with is, what's most exciting to you about how things could shift and what could it look like? What are, what are you trying to achieve in terms of housing justice by doing this work? Have a conversation, have at each other. Well, I mean, I'm really curious to hear about um, reactions that your work, Rashid, I know this you did this work a, a while ago, but, um, you know, and how, how communities have used it, both of either of you. Sure. Uh, so... Yeah, so I, uh, it was uh, my thesis was published 2013, 2014, and um, shortly uh, or a few years after, uh, a new tenants movement emerged in Alameda. And during that time, I saw some of the mechani mechanizations of some of the uh, the local landlords and some realtors. And what I realized is that folks didn't know that history. Um, some of the folks who were organizing and, you know, one of my elders, um, CSLU, uh, was attempting to inform some folks and she got some sort of uh, some some range of like racist, misogynist uh, response to this to this black woman trying to like warn folks like, hey, some of this stuff has happened before. And so um, I started doing like public presentations on this work. I um, and it was helpful because I could both share the work, get feedback identify new sources. And um, I've noticed somewhat of a shift around some of the public discourse around housing history in Alameda. And I got uh, maybe two decent examples of that, but I don't think anything that was, uh, I don't know, super substantive in my opinion. So uh, the first example, um, after George Floyd was murdered, um, my, my, my uh, thesis is published on e-scholarship. So it's this uh, sort of open source, open access um, U University of California platform. And so it shows the statistics of like how many times it's downloaded and viewed. And so it was like May, June, 2020, you know, all of these downloads, right? And so um, the other thing that was interesting, so my research was used uh, by the campaign to over... I don't know, overturn or um, I forgot the, the phrase, but uh, basically to repeal parts of Measure A, the exclusionary um, zoning ordinance. And so an infographic was made that was essentially a timeline showing the um, the different efforts uh, that, you know, the housing advocates have used over time. So that would be like an example of like, I think how it, it was used. It was distilled into this format that could be more accessible. And then I have a chapter in the um, anti, uh, what is it? The anti-eviction mapping project. They pr produced a book last year. Um, and so I have a timeline that's in there as well. Um, as far as like a fantasy, a dream, you know, there's, there was a, um, a part of that lawsuit in 1989 was, it's not really a first right of refusal, but it's an opportunity, you know, the right to return for folks who were displaced. And this is something that to this day, the housing authority, they send out these notices for folks to be able to come back to Alameda. And so, you know, I think my hope for, for those of us that have been um, displaced is for us to have a place um, within Alameda. And so some people would use a reparations uh, framework to describe that. 
um you know what's the format like is that like the form of the housing is that ownership is it co-ownership is it a cooperative you know the alameda housing authority their first property was a, a whites only housing cooperative initially it was just a housing project but in 1948 it became essentially a whites only um uh development and you know from my research to this day i don't know of any black people that have owned it. It's been a couple of people I've seen <laughs> enter and exit some of them, but they don't uh, actually reside or live there as far as I know. So I think, um, yeah, I think that would be, uh, you know, that opportunity for all these people that have been displaced for the Hackett family who whose home was taken in 1935 so that um, the rest of Alameda's could have power. There is a central substation for the local power company that was built on the former property of a, a early black pioneer and black family. So I think those are all things that, um, you know, like whatever their family, their descendants want. I don't know if it's a Bruce's Beach sort of situation like Manhattan Beach, um, but, you know, some some of that harm to uh, to be repaired. Mm. I'll just second Rashid's vision and dream for the future for housing justice. I feel like that that's so beautiful and I appreciate you sharing that, Rashid. Um, for us, one thing I'll share about the reaction to the report or the response um, was that we found that there was a really amazing response from teachers, um, like K through 12 teachers in the region. And um, we, ended up working with a graduate student at Berkeley, Danielle Fogel, to develop a summer teacher institute of sorts. Um, that was a week long space for us to work with teachers to um, have conversations about this history, to explore it together, and then mm -hmm. to work with them to develop curriculum for young people um, to really be able to understand this history and position themselves in um, thinking about what it is that they can do about it as agents for change. Um, and so I think we're planning to release some of that curriculum that was developed in the relatively near future. So that's something to stay tuned for. Um, and, and I was really grateful that we have gotten a lot of response from folks who are interested in um, having us share more about the, the report. Um, at different community meetings, um, like historical societies have reached out to us and um, and have been really um, glad to hear that the work has been helpful for a lot of community organizations that have been fighting the fight for housing justice for a very long time. Um, and so we've also been in conversation with folks who are talking about reparations and reparative strategies locally in, Berkeley and other places. And, and it's been really amazing to see how um, folks are doing their own planning for making housing justice real right now, like in, in the very present day. And Susan, I'd love to hear also about the reactions to your report. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. I, I love hearing about that. Um, I would say the reaction's been mixed. Um, <laughs> gotten some hate mail, but um, you know, I consider that to be uh, a positive thing, really. Yeah, it means I'm bothering somebody. But um, yeah, I mean, in, when the report first came out, I was on a lot of, um, you know, interviewed here and there and on a lot of, of webinars and, and all of that. It was still, you know, webinar land. It wasn't anything really happening in person. Um, and, uh, you know, definitely what I was, what I, thought was great was that were a lot of um, folks within suburban communities who were definitely the minority in these communities. And then by minority, I mean minority of a particular view that they wanted more housing justice and they wanted more affordable housing and they wanted more racial and economic diversity in their communities. And they'd organize these panels and events. And, um, you know, and the and the number of people who would show up really varied. I mean, sometimes I'd be talking to like seven people and then other times there'd be 105 or, and, um, but it was great to, to see this sort of um, activity within these places and to remember that there are people 
who um, who want change. Um, and, um, you know, they don't get a lot of support. But one of the things I feel like this report helped do was help those people in different communities kind of find each other too, um, and then get involved in state level organizations and do, do that type of, of advocacy for sure. Um, I will say that um, one of the things, Nicole, that you've achieved is probably one of the dreams for me for this research is to is to move it into some sort of uh, curriculum for high school students um, and participatory action um, among youth organizations. There's um, a bunch of youth organizations like um, Har Hartford Partnership for Youth or I can't remember quite the name of it who are doing these participatory action projects. And I just feel like this is the perfect type of, of subject to do it around. And a lot of people say, well, what should be done? You know, what are the solutions? And I always say, you know, I can give you a bunch of policy recommendations and practice recommendations. They're not things I thought of. It's mostly the Open Communities Alliance, which is a grassroots organization in Hartford that advocates for housing justice. So I could say all of those things have to happen in the legislature. But I think ultimately, like my hope is that this will raise awareness and begin these conversations and that within the communities, that's where you'll find the solutions for, for reparations. And one of the things that I've been trying to, to make clear is that this report is about racial segregation and to a lesser extent, the way that racial segregation reinforces and creates inequality. But that doesn't mean that when you're coming up with, with what the repair for those sins basically are, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's just about reducing segregation. You know, it's not just about like, oh, we want to have an integrated community, you know, or we, you know, we want black people can now, you know, move easier to the suburbs. That's not what the repair is. It's maybe it's a reinvestment in black and brown communities or, and, and I'm not the person to say what that is or should be. Um, that's, emerges out of the community conversations. The people there will have much better ideas than I do about what that would look like. But my dream is that it will start those conversations or help ground those conversations, approve justification for the, for the repair. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I could listen to y'all talk all day and I know that there are people who have questions. Um, I'm noticing, and I'm just grabbing these questions as they come. Karen said, but I, I just want to start with one piece of gratitude before we jump into question. Karen Brown says, thank you for taking us beyond stats, important as they are to naming some families. I think that's really important about the work that you're doing, that you're really connected to the community. Um, one question is um, for Rashid. Did you do all this work by yourself? I'm working on something similar with another person and find us find it almost overwhelming. Uh, any uh, historian will tell you that uh, they could not do any of this without archivists and librarians. So um, certainly didn't do it by myself. Uh, in that respect, uh, had the advisement of Eula Taylor when I started my work. Um, but largely, like yeah, that's me at the library in the microfilm and you know, some dusty place or whatever. Um, and, you know, just thinking about um, some of the trends I've seen around research, community-based research, you know, if you have opportunity to collaborate with folks, I would encourage you, you know, if you're able to work in that way um, to do it. And that could be whether, uh, that could be either some part of the uh, research, like identifying documents or if writing, um, if that's helpful. Um, to get feedback or write collaboratively, but um, yeah, so it's um, it's it's both a solo uh, effort and it's it's a, it's a team. Like I couldn't do it without people sharing their stories with me. The people who come to, who came to my talks at the library, like, hey, um, here's this document from you know this time period, or you know some other folks who've written about um, stuff. Um, I get into you know I've had these interesting, um, I'll say conversations, debates with a local historian Woody Miner, um, who I have some different, uh, I have some a different analysis around some things with, but I wouldn't be able to do um, any or half of what I've done if he hadn't done a lot of legwork prior um, from not only just doing research. Um, 
to even creating guides of where to find stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't think it's a, it may be a solo project, but it's never, um, it's never alone. Mm. Yes, thank you, Rashid. And, and a, a question for any of you, um, how can we use the growing body? This is from Milton Reynolds. How can we use the growing body of scholarship to speak directly to regionally based reparations or transitional justice processes? And then anybody can take that one. I mean, I think that the first step is making sure that, you know, that there that we have connections, that the people, a lot of times the people who are doing this type of work maybe are a little different from us and maybe they're in the academy, right? <laughs> I mean, we're all, I'm all in the academy too. We're all in the academy, you know, to some extent, but to make sure that those connections to those organizations and those um, processes, which are happening all across the country right now, um, you know, have both, you know, access to work that has been done, and maybe support and um, and this is where the this is one of the recommendations I made in the report about philanthropy really should be in this in the to the extent that there anybody is supporting these processes. Um, that there should be support for this type of research um, to be done. Um, and that th and this type of research, as we all know, is time consuming and it can be really expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's a pairing with people who have done it before and who have experience, then um, that can be really beneficial because it's it's it just helps make the case for reparations in these really specific granular ways. I mean, Rashid, you just mentioned like a, that person's house was taken mm -hmm. for this purpose. Like there's a lot of examples like that, that you would, that you would find that you would dig in, but it's, yeah, it's time consuming and, and challenging. Thank you, Susan. Does anyone else want to answer that question? I know there's there's a lot more questions that folks have, but I want to make sure that folks weigh in if they want to. Yeah, since my work is really uh, this this work at least is very local, like thinking about it regionally um, is somewhat of a challenging question. Actually, um, I think one way in which that does come forward to me, um, or a response at least, like when I had to Google transitional justice because I didn't, I still don't know what that means. I know I know it, it popped up when I just googled it, but um, as far as uh, housing, you know, there is this effort now related to the housing element so every city has to have a housing element and one portion of it is something called affirmatively furthering fair housing and so there have to be these efforts that cities take like they can't just say it but they have to uh counter uh, some of the historic segregation that's taking place and so i think um one method is getting involved in those processes or at least when those come up to get certified like folks critiquing that. And so if these cities do not get their housing elements certified, there's a lot of money from the state that they're not able to get. And so there is now a, a big incentive for folks to not just say, for cities to not just say, hey, we're going to zone for this housing and then not actually do it. But, um, you know, to utilize, I think that affirmatively fair, um, affirmatively furthering fair housing, AFFH, um, to to push um, for some things. But again, that's locally. Um, and even though some of it is like allocated regionally, like how many how, um, housing, uh, you know, what levels of housing each jurisdiction is supposed to provide, I think that may be one example. Milton, I, I'm Milton, I'm looking at the name Milton there. Rashid, thank you so much for, for answering that question, for Googling um, right in the middle of our conversation here. Uh, Nicole, do you want to add something to that question? Sure. Um, for us at the Institute, Eli and me, um, we've been thinking a lot about what we can do to shift um, power and, and how we can center voices of people who are most impacted in decisions about what housing justice looks like and 
what needs to be done on a regional level and, and thinking about who should be centered in regional processes and planning around housing. Um, and so that's, I think that's really important work that a lot of groups on the ground have been organizing around and calling for for a very long time. And, and I'm really um, gleaning hope from the momentum around community-driven solutions that are making housing justice a reality. And so for us, it, it's been important to document both those histories and, and current experiences around structural racism through housing and, and also the solutions that people are identifying and, and trying to lift those up in whatever spaces that we can. I don't thank you so much, Nicole. And just so you know, there's a ton of buzz in the chat and I don't know if you all can see it about reparations. And I'm gonna ask one of the questions from Jackie um, Lorenzar. I, I'm probably not saying your name properly, but I'm um, so I apologize. Um, but, but Jackie says, so grateful for the amazing work each of you has done. Do you have suggestions for how cities can use your scholarship to address some of the impacts of past policy decisions. And then I'll ask one more about reparations. And anybody can take this one. Suggestions for cities, how cities can use your scholarship to address some of the impacts of past policy decisions. That's a tricky one. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I think um, where it may be tricky for some people is because of the uh, the distinction people attempt to make between public and private. And so this idea of like, oh, the, this was actually a private decision. These restrictive covenants, these were this was private. It was an agreement between homeowners. But yeah, that was reinforced by the court system and the state. Uh, and so uh, anyway, uh, so like that distinction, like I don't necessarily uh, make such a clear distinction between public and private and so much public stuff has been privatized and so so much private stuff is like uses the state to maintain it. So uh, I think that uh, the examples I've, I've given in uh, publicly in the past in Alameda relate to uh, relate to housing. And so, again, I gave the example of the Hackett family. And so, again, in 19 quick version of this is in 1935, there was an effort to create a new public um, uh, utilities building and uh, to generate power. And so somehow that property, along with some others adjacent to it, were chosen. And so from the records I currently have, uh, they were compensated $950 uh, for the property. And you know, it was at least $200,000 uh, with some money that was given from the Public Works uh, Administration. This is like one of these um, these uh, uh, depression era projects. And so, you know, they built this, you know, this this building, this edifice, this national landmark uh, or one of these historic registered landmarks. And it still generates power for people today. So it required the displacement of this black family, among others. And they're the only ones, at least from the documents I've seen, that stated that there was a threat of legal action. And so, you know, I've put information forward to the family and I'm like, look, it's on y'all as far as like what repair looks like for you because mm -hmm. this happened to your family. Uh, and then beyond just the Hackett family, like I mentioned, all of us that have been displaced over multiple uh, generations. And so there still is this, um, I'm calling it a right to return. That's not what the housing authority calls it. But, you know, I'm curious how that may be expanded again in 1987. People's rent was increased in the Buena Vista apartments. And there was this um, lawsuit that happened, settled in 89, that required, you know, so much affordable housing to be replaced. And to this day, that still hasn't been fully built. And each time there is a new housing um, property that is built, um, or there's new housing from the housing authority that's available, they have to contact those folks. And so, you know, how does that get expanded to folks who have been formally evicted, um, whether just cause or not, people who have been informally evicted from, you know, landlords raising the price or, you know, doing other tactics. And so anyway, I think like just looking squarely at the, these policies in the past that the cities have engaged in, 
um, the neglect of tenants, the um, the purposeful eviction or, or the displacement of homeowners or renters. And then from that, like, how do you how do you repair that and what policy? So I don't have always some like specifics, but like I mentioned earlier, whether that's housing, cooperative, and then the questions around like giving land uh, for me is a little more uh, complicated because it's like, oh yeah, give some black folks some land, but whose unceded land are you really on? And so then we get into a whole other uh, conundrum of stolen people and stolen on stolen land. It's complicated. That's that's the truth. It's complicated. Any other um, panelists, Susan or Nicole, you want to jump in on that question? And and you could also add, like, we can add into the mix since um, Rashid is kind of talking really about reparations as as part of the, the answer to this. Like one question, another question related to it, and you can answer either. Um, Barbara Sutherland says to all panelists, who do you see as the audience for your works? Is one goal to change white attitudes, especially about white entitlement and possibility about reparations? So I can go. Um, so my it's interesting when I started out talking about this and I put a picture of the report on there and all the different organizations um, that was purposeful because we all have different audiences. Some of them overlap a little bit. Um, but, um, you know, I would say the audience for this particular report is actually quite large and we addressed it in the, our recommendations to philanthropy. We addressed it to, you know, civil right, the civil rights community in terms of litigators and possible ways in and building legal theory around some of these, um, documented harms. And we addressed it to elected officials. Um, and we addressed it to organizations, grassroots organizations who are doing work in um, related to housing justice, relating to school integration, all of those, all of those kinds of things. Um, so, um, so that is the, the answer, answer to that question. And I think there was a second part that slipped my mind. But to the previous question about how can cities use it, I'm not sure maybe the questioner meant just communities within cities, not necessarily city governments, but I mm -hmm. guess whatever, I just think it's really important to also to really think about the state because a lot of the times the things that local governments are doing, like say zoning, which is big in the, in the Northeast, particularly way of, of racial and economic exclusion, is it's a power that's actually granted by the states to local communities. And local communities are really creatures of the state. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so that's another thing to, to, to keep in mind, to always be thinking about the state. And then ultimately, of course, the federal government as well, but just to not get completely overwhelmed, just to, to, uh, to try to think about those things simultaneously. Mm, thank you so much. Susan, Nicole, you wanna add? Any thoughts? This will be our final, sure. this was our final question and then we're gonna be wrapping in just a minute. Sure, to go back to the earlier question, um, as a starting point, I think for local and regional governments, um, recognizing and acknowledging this history and um, starting from a place of um, knowing that any policy solution that is aimed at creating racially equitable housing systems has to start with confronting the history and then developing targeted solutions that address the specific forms of harm. So um, really getting at the granular level to understand how different groups are situated differently, largely because of the history of exclusion and dispossession, and then um, understanding how systems today are impacting people in different ways and then building solutions that respond directly to those specific impacts is what i would say to that question i'll turn it back to you sir thank you so much nicole and thank you all of you um before we end just one final question for all three of you and then and then uh as one of my great mentors says let the chat flow like a river. If folks have gratitude that they wanna share with these amazing researchers, please do that in the chat as they share their last sentence. But it's, but it's such distilled in one sentence. What's um, one thing that you want us to remember about your research? One thing that's a nugget. Based on this conversation of just all the work you've done, 
one final thing that you wanted to take to have the audience um, remember about your research? And I'll start with Susan. Ah, oh my God. Um, <laughs> I didn't write this one down. Uh, I would say- Oh, good. Emergent. To remember that, uh, that, people's, li that people, people's lives have been um, shaped uh, and, and uh, circumscribed because of this history. Mm, Susan, thank you. Let's take a breath, all of us. Yeah, let it soak in. Beautiful, thank you. And Nicole. Uh, I'd say that um, we all have to step back and ask what is our responsibility as members of this society and as actors embedded in various institutions that hold power um, to transform the systems that continue to perpetuate that harm. Yes, Nicole, thank you. And Rashid. All of our lives have been shaped and influenced by residential racial segregation. And we need to address it if we want the lives of our children, grandchildren, and beyond um, those who come be beyond us um, to be better and not circumscribed by racial hierarchy. Mm, Rashid, thank you so much. And I'm gonna read a few of the, the gratitudes as we exit here. Thank you each for your work that you do and the ways you've shown up here today. Stay scrappy. <laughs> that might be the word for the day. Um, thank you each of, of you so much for sharing your research. Thank you for all the work you've done to make the invisible visible. Thank you everyone and the Othering and Belonging Institute for this wonderful talk. Also gratitude to Sarah, oh, thank you, for the movement and breath work today. Much needed and much appreciated. You are so welcome, Brittany. Thanks to all of you for what you are doing and for the sessions today. I hope this work becomes very well known throughout the country. There is so much work to do. So much good gratitude. Thank you to Mark for handling all the tech for us today to make sure that we look good, that we sound right, and that the, the questions came up. We really appreciate it. Oh, one more uh, gratitude from Jackie. Thank you for addressing my question. Your work is very needed. We need to transform our governments to support racial equity and mitigate past harms. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, one more breath for everybody. <sighs> yes, and a reminder about the mapping tool that my, me and Nicole mentioned already, the mapping tool, Mapping Race in America, the explainer video comes out today. This is like a big day for, for um, this work. And um, Mark, if you don't mind putting that link in the chat just one more time. And so much gratitude for this work. So lovely to be in conversation with all of you. Thank you so much. And thank you to those of you in the audience who joined and let the, flow, the chat flow like a river and stayed connected to what's going on and did some movement and some breath work today. And just for your commitment to, to this work, powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you.